Well, I'm pleased once again to catch up with a friend and a very interesting personality, Dr. Charles Okia Halam here on Tim Modise Talk. And uh, let me also uh, acknowledge my friend David Mashabela for allowing me to work here at his studios, the David Mashabela Studios. So it's wonderful, uh, Dr. Charles, to have great friends like yourself, great friends like David. And here we are to talk about ideas that then can help our country and Africa to move forward. And thanks for your time. Thanks, Tim. It's very good to be here. And uh, thanks to David for this lovely studio as well. Sure. And I'm always fascinated by people like yourself who have a sense of how the world works, right? We experience the world happening to us. We see money moving in, moving out, financial uh, systems crashing now and again. We told the economy is growing. Sometimes it's not growing. And then we sit there, we've got business ideas, and we wonder why when we apply, we don't get any approvals or we don't get any funding. That's why I have you here, Dr. <laughs> Charles, so that you can make me smart and make whoever is watching our interview smarter. Yeah. So I appreciate that uh, you made the time well, thanks to a be lot, with us. And thanks, um, just a brief background, uh, Dr. Charles Okia Halam is advisor and has been advisor to various governments and uh, reserve banks or central banks on, on the continent and being part of the African Development Bank, the foundation of the AU, as well as the chairman of the AGH Asset Fund based here in South Africa. So he'll talk, talk to us a bit more about that. But, you know, at what point did you realize that the direction that you took professionally was the right one, that you should study corporate finance and banking? Wow, Tim, that's such a question because it goes back maybe four decades ago. Um, but um, I think I thought that it was important to understand how money works yeah. and understand how the economy works and understand how people um, build enterprises, how people develop themselves. I was very keen to understand why some countries were very, very developed and some countries were not and why some people made a lot of money and some other people were quite poor. Sure, but, you know, I, I, I will start with a broader question, a broad question, that we all know that Africa is resource-rich and uh, human capital endowed with a strong young population. But for some reason, with all the mineral resources that we have, and uh, nature has been kind to the continent in that, you know, even, even food is in abundance. But now and again, we have food shortages on the continent. And with all of those things, somehow our economies are not growing as they should. And most of the time, we are told or we learn that it seems to have something to do with the allocation of capital. Why is that the case? Well, you know, Tim, our history is very, very complex. It's a colonial history, then independence, then a search for identity. Um, so, you know, you have to look at these, uh, that history and various aspects of that history to be able to understand why, as you say, you know, we're resource rich. Some would say it's a resource curse in some way. Um, uh, and also understand the issue about, uh, about the absence of institutions and absence of good governance, which is an important um, aspect of development without good governance you can have all the resources but the, you won't get the um, result that you want okay but we tend to blame as africans right that, that it's a it's a problem that is brought about by other people but then those other people would say okay fair enough that's what happened the countries were under colonial rule for a long time, but some countries, take Nigeria, for instance, have been independent for uh, for more than five decades. South Africa, close on what now? I mean, apartheid ended 30 years ago, thereabouts. We've been a democratic country 27 years, but there must be something that we're doing wrong, I suppose, over time. Broadly speaking, in terms of the attraction and allocation of capital and the growth of our economy is your own take. Where do you think we are missing the point? So apart from institutions, you have to have a savings culture. You have to have an investment culture. 
to be able to um, attract foreign investment, you have to have domestic investment. There has to be a sense that the local people are willing to save, to invest in their own economies, to attract um, outside money, outside capital. So outside capital will come in when it sees that domestic capital is being put to work as well, which can only arise through savings. The institutional issues and governance issues and the legacy issues, particularly in a country like South Africa, means that a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of people have not had the opportunity to build up savings, mm. right? Um, but after a while, over decades, um, and now we're 27 years, as you say, since independence here, yeah, through the rights to universal adult suffrage in South Africa, you, you, one should now uh, see a higher savings culture, a lot more uh, people taking risks to invest, because an investment is a risk, a calculated risk. And um, that should now start showing itself. But that needs the support of good government, good institutions, um, the rule of law, um, transparency, all of those things that everybody takes as it's apple pie, you know, mm. apple pie and custard. But it's important. Without those things, it's very difficult to get everything to work the way it's meant to. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of people, and uh, thanks again for coming to our event uh, recently at Chaguma. In Midland. That was good and fun. It was good fun. And people yeah. enjoyed the talk, yeah, you know. Yeah. And and I'm, I only have to raise some of the questions that they, they okay. raised, raised in their interaction with, with you. Right. And, and this is one of the questions expected. That with the advent of democracy, political freedoms in South Africa, the expectation was that the black majority in the country will somehow be empowered, participate in all sectors of the economy in a much more substantial manner. But we ended up with what is more or less the same arrangements of the past with oligopolies all over the place. And many, 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 many uh, entrepreneurs in South Africa, black ones in particular, are of the view that the financial institutions discriminate against them. Is, is that your view or what do you think is going on? You know... Um Finance is 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 um, not scarce necessarily, but scared. It it uh, it behaves in a way. It looks for the best opportunity. There's an opportunity cost. If I put my ten rand here, will I have the opportunity to put the ten rand elsewhere? Uh, the problem with BE um, was that it was. A good hope, you know, and it's like a good intention, but it wasn't well structured. So a lot of the same people that uh, benefited via government relationships at the time continue to benefit at the exclusion of a lot of other people. Mm. So capital went naturally to the places where it could seek advantage. So you can't um, uh, say that that was a negative thing because all capital did is what capital normally does. Mm. Go to the place where there's a the lowest point of risk for the highest point of return or expected return. Mm. But the problem with BE was that it wasn't broad enough. It wasn't, it wasn't inclusive enough. Some have argued and some have put forward the view that, you know, when, when you do this kind of wealth transfer in a society, it'll always be those people. Remember the conversation that we had at Shaguma? Mm. Sure, sure, sure. It'll always be a small group of people who mm. are politically connected, who mm. will be the first people at the banquet who will, be, who will have the first rights to mm. everything. And the capital will follow that op those opportunities presented by that group. Mm. What we had hoped for in South Africa and what we still hope for is that there would be now a transfer, a movement from that first group, right, and, and to another grouping, a, a broader-based grouping in its real sense. And mm. That would mean investing in smaller businesses, right, um, investing in businesses which ordinarily would um, need a subsidy of some form, either in the price of capital or in the form of capacity, mm. you know, um, to be able to, uh, or skills training, to be able to take advantage of capital. Capital will stay neutral in many ways. So to expect capital capital and banks, right, to play the role of social policy, mm. right, is, is, is a bit difficult. That, that's not what they're designed to actually do. They'll say, present to us cases and situations in which we can invest in, and we will cert certainly invest in those. But then, the counter-argument would be, banks and financial institutions generally are regulated. That's in the first instance. Mm. Secondly, people will say, but we do contribute to retirement funds. Mm -hmm. And then it is those retirement funds that dominate the ownership of the banks, but they do not reflect the management and the direct benefit from 
from the banks and how they operate do not direct, uh, directly benefit the black majority, mm-hmm. but through indirectly through the, the 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 pension funds and the retirement funds that they actually have contributed to the funding of these institutions. Yes, that's absolutely right. And some would then say that um, it's important that those retirement funds now allocate a proportion of those funds to. Um, to black businesses, to smaller yeah, yeah. businesses. That's logical, right? Yes. The issue is, how do we make um, those banks see those firms as attractive? Do we compel them? Do we give them incentives? Do we coerce them? Do we uh, sugarcoat the, the the opportunities that exist, right? How is it that we do so? Do we say that because a proportion of those savings happen to be black savings, then we need that money to be allocated to a particular place? Mm. But you know that these funds and these um, trustees and these uh, large-scale long-term investment uh, instruments, right, um, vehicles, they have mandates. They have to deliver particular amounts of money by a particular date to a particular mm. cohort of mm. people who are retiring, mm. right? Mm. So if you were to force them or compel them as one of our options, right, and say that you have to do this because it's 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 a fact that the source of capital is derived from black people. Yeah. It's possible that at the end, what you will get is people point a finger and say, well, my pension, right? Yeah. Um, I have not been able to get the full scale. I can only get 85% of my pension because 15% of it was lost because you allocated funds to this particular type sure. of business. Yeah. Now, for us though, that's, that, that doesn't take away the social need, right, to get black businesses funded, right? Yeah. And that's why I have three things in my bonnet about small business and not just black business, but but black business, black small business, right? And black medium scale business. We have to allocate capital. We have to have compliance, right? Mm-hmm. And we have to have capacity that these, these businesses have to have um, the skills, right? Mm. And that's why if you remember at um, our last meeting, Shaguma that evening I said that perhaps one of the areas that has not been talked about in fact there are two but the one of the really key areas is the issue of capacity could it be that the role that we should expect banks to play is to say ordinarily we wouldn't invest in your business sure right Mm -hmm. we wouldn't provide capital for this business but these are a range of things to build up your capacity Right, mm-hmm. and if you were able to do those, that would de-risk this this project or these businesses, sure. and we would fund them, right? And that would mean some kind of public-private partnership, right? So government says that that we're not compelling banks, but it's it's in your interest as banks sure. to broaden your lending portfolio, right? Mm-hmm. And that what we're trying to do now is uh, de-risk a whole bunch of opportunities which wouldn't be there, right, because you perceive them to be too risky by giving them greater capacity, increasing their capacity to meet compliance. And we're going to push down the costs of compliance by not putting too many regulations on small businesses. Mm -hmm. And that would allow capital. And those are three C's. Capital, compliance, and capacity. Let me let me pursue my argument a little bit. Yeah. People look around and say, okay, we understand the risk and we understand the returns and all that, but the same uh, retirement funds and uh, other financial institutions continue to grant state-owned entities loans. And we know that they are guaranteed by the government to some extent, but what if some of those entities fail? For instance, they mentioned... SAA, Mike mentioned, Dinell, and then they look at ESCOM. So there is South African pension money in there. Mm. And that money, who knows what will happen down the line. So the risk has been taken, but it's in favor of the state-owned enterprises and it's not in favor of the small, medium-sized enterprises that would have created employment anyway, given that uh, high unemployment is one of our serious challenges in the country. And the only people or people who are better placed to create jobs are those um, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises? Exactly. Those three examples that, that you've given are a clear example of how not to 
run a developing economy, yeah. right? Yeah. To place state uh, savings. And do you understand that the monies that have been lost in ESCOM and SAA, in Danel and elsewhere, and the savings of the average South African, and the majority of South Africans are black. So the majority of those people that have lost that, those monies are black people. That means no schools, no, 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 no um, roads, mm. no water, no electricity. But if you look at those three examples, right, you can clearly see that okay how have they raised that money the government would argue that those um, enterprises could issue bonds and people lend to those corporates yeah. because the government is standing behind yes. them right yes so that's why a lot of pe people have argued that those businesses and they are businesses and they should be treated as businesses they are utilities mm. in some sense well like saa mm. is not yeah. neither is denel but mm. escom is mm. a utility the argument is that there should have been more competition either in the case of ESCOM with its generation business, mm. in its transmission business, which is fixed line, less able mm. to put competition in transmission. Uh, but certainly in distribution, more competition. You would have created more jobs, which would have meant giving more people an opportunity to play in the energy space and electricity space. Sure. And then make a part of it a conditionality that perhaps black businesses are involved in those other businesses that would provide competition to ESCOM. And then that would have made more sense than simply continue to throw state money at ESCOM. So you and I are in, in agreement there. But uh, the government, and some would then argue that the government can give a guarantee to these state-owned enterprises because that's exactly what they are. Yeah. They are state-owned enterprises, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that takes us into a whole new area, Tim, of com issues of competition, market structure, industrial yeah. structure, which you and I have talked of uh, over uh, cups uh, of uh, And somebody can also continue I can go down the line of this argument anyway. I've heard it before. Somebody saying, you know, on one hand, you take uh, money as loans or whatever, uh, uh, you know, through bonds from from uh, South Africans and uh, majority black people through their retirement funds and so on. And then you take the taxes paid by the same people and the companies that operate in South Africa to provide guarantees to money borrow. You know, it's. You get my drift, yeah, right? Yeah, no, I do, I do. <laughs> so I, I take money from from one no, pocket, I, yeah. from, from your right it, pocket, and yeah. then I go to your left pocket, left-hand pocket, yeah. and say, okay, from your le left-hand pocket, I'm guaranteeing yeah. the loan that I took from the right hand. Yeah, so I take it from your fixed uh, part of your balance sheet, and I take you to your current income, and I also take money from it, right? yes. the current part of your balance yes. sheet. And I understand that, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, frustration and anger about that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so there's no ready argument that defends the, the policy that we've had hitherto about the support of state-owned enterprises, sure. right? And in the whole issue of state-owned enterprises, uh, it's a kind of like an outdated a model, right? Important in a developmental state such as South Africa's, right? But that doesn't mean that we had to have this monolithic uh, approach to the supply of what we of the objective. What is the objective of ESCOM? It's electricity, broadly stated for every South African, yes. so that every South African has a particular amount of kilowatts of electricity every day sure. for the, just to live, right? And so there were many models beyond ESCOM, for example, which could have included private enterprise to achieve that objective, right? And and therein would have created, if you had done that, deregulated the, 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 the energy space, right? You would have created the opportunities for private capital to come in. Now, you could have then said, if you had a proper regulatory framework, you could have then said, as a condition of this deregulation, right, private capital should do its very best and short of compelling it, to involve all spectra of business, right, across the society to participate in the supply of and distribution mm. of electricity. Mm. So many firms would have now come into the market, right, and they would have specific aspects of the value chain to, in, in which to play in. Mm. And smaller companies would have come in. Now, you know as well as I do, Tim, that immediately you would have done that. You would have had the issue of the union uh, issue. Then you'd have to play the statement and you have to be very clear in your statement. How do we ensure that jobs are, are maintained as a, when we move to the private um, sector to supply this energy? Sure. Then it goes down the road of politics and the issue of the coalition government that 
existed for a long time. Mm. Um, we were partners in the Tripartite Alliance and all the rest of it, right? Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why the, the decisions that should have been taken, right, towards a higher model of economic efficiency weren't taken. But coming back to small business, you're right. Unless you build um, a, a, a society of entrepreneurs, people willing to start up and sustain small businesses, they're ever dependent on the state. They're dependent at the end of the month for a salary. They are dependent on the social services of the state. And the state can only provide so much. The population growth in Africa, which you and I talked about the other day, where you see 68% mm. of Africa's population is less than 30 years old. Obviously, the statist model can't sustain this. So you and I are, are, are walking down the same road about this, right? It's about... Structural reform. South Africa's economy needs significant structural reform. And how would that reform look like, broadly speaking? You know, More from... competition, for yeah. one. Okay. So in yeah. the banking sector, for example, license a few more banks, right? right. And what's going to happen is that um, some of those banks will fail. And the big banks will say that these banks will come in and cloud and muddy the waters and give the South African financial system a bad name. Some of us would also argue that it'll provide opportunities for others to enter the, 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 the financial marketplace and make the place more complex for regulators, which is true. But at the same time, it might make pricing more keen and take away some of the fat and in encourage the established banks to price more keenly and look for business in areas, just as when Capitec had come into, has come into the retail mm. space. Mm. 10 years or 12 years, I think 12 years ago, Capitec didn't exist. Now it's the fifth, I think, biggest bank in the country, has a huge number, and I don't have it to hand, of um, retail um, customers. That means that uh, that market existed, right? And if Capitec had not come in, that would still be dominated by primarily the, the, big, uh, four the, the big four banks. Yeah. And so perhaps this can happen for the financing of small business, right? Um, so that you now get credit policy that says, uh, and credit committees that say, oh, let's go to Harankua. Let's go to Katlahong, where there's a bakery. Mm. Harankua, there's a person there. Well, I'll, I'll, vote yeah, you. He, I'll support that. He, he, <laughs> because <laughs> if you put Harankua on the map, and then we say, fine, well, let, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. That, that, that's why I chose Harankua. <laughs> I know. I chose Harankua specifically because of you, Tim. Yeah. And let's go to those places. And let's... Well, my friend Stan will be happy to know that you mentioned Katla Hong as well. Katla so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let's go, okay, Tembisa. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tembisa as well. Okay. Tembisa 10. <laughs> those who, who believe in it will yeah. also be happy to know, to know that we're mentioning that. And let's go to those places and find small businesses because there are business people in those areas and yeah. find ways to fund them, right? And so you got to deregulate the financial space whilst keeping the prudential or the regulatory framework sound, right? So that mm -hmm. you have the financial system stable. Then you've got to look at the other um, parts of the industrial economy and look at ways to increase uh, more competition, which means a lot of work for the Competition Commission, mm. which frankly, in my opinion, hasn't been as robust as it could have been. You know, I want to talk about the um, DFIs, all right? Developmental financial Devel institutions that, are, that, that exist in the country because there was a lot of hope that they would play a significant role, firstly, in the uh, transformation of the economy as well as the empowerment of the previously excluded and disempowered black majority. But uh, many people who've approached them complain that they get treated the same way as the banks treat them, that they use the same uh, risk, and credit risk uh, management tools as used by, 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 by the big five banks. Yeah, uh, but you, Tim, remember that the public um, money, the a public rand is no less valuable than a private rand. So sometimes one has to look at the criticism of development finance institutions in a guarded way as well, Yeah. right? Once again, 
if the development finance institutions were to be profligate and 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 do things which were they were not to to follow particular risk processes or credit processes yeah. it's once again the very same criticism would be that the dbsa or the idc has done certain things and funded this and has lost the taxpayer this amount of yeah. money yeah, yeah. you'd have the ceo and the chairman of these institutions in front of parliament trying to explain how so many billion rands went out the door and the loan portfolio is not being performed it's not performing and they've lost so how do we make dfis work effectively i think it's of course getting a right structure for the kind of assets that dfis fund right and putting in safeguards and what are those the safeguards are to have dfis work very closely as they do now to some extent with non-DFI sources of finance. Mm. Broaden your sources of finance as widely as possible so that you have a whole spectrum, equity providers, debt providers, uh, subsidized equity providers such as DFIs if necessary, subsidized debt providers, DFIs again, funds which are sustainability or, 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 or climate or energy or, 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 or not entirely for profit funds so that when you make this um, source of funding a complicated one, right, you increase the range of monitoring and you must have a way that you say, what is the objective of this investment? Is it to have the highest ROE? Is it to have the highest impact? Right. Yeah. Uh, is, what is, is this? Is is this investment a cat? What, what what we call a catalytic investment, mm -hmm. or is it um, a, a profit invest, a growth investment? Are we looking to make the highest return? In that case, it's not the DFIs that you're looking for necessarily. Yeah? you're looking for uh, sources of funds that will that will give you with their structure the best point of return. DFIs can come in and say, look. We're going to take 30 businesses or 40 businesses or 50 businesses, whatever the number, and we're going to find a way, right, to, to, to put soft finance, lower cost finance, in other words, into these businesses. Mm. Why are we doing that? They're going to create jobs for one, right? They're going to make a return. We're not going to lose our capital, right, on and having done this. And we are going to meet a social objective, which is positive. So rather than making 17% annualized return every year, we're going to make higher than the cost of inflation plus a margin. So let's say inflation is 6%, which it is not yet in South Africa. It is more like about 4 or 5 and then we add a 50% mark markup on that, taking us to about 8%, 9%, 10%. Knowing, of course, that the discount rate in South Africa still is about 12%. So we would be losing money on that structure from a purely financial point of mm. view. But from an impact point of view, we would be doing the things that we want to do to support entrepreneurs, support uh, business and supporting particular black business. Let's look at this discussion and the, the issues that we've raised then from the point of view of the entrepreneur uh, that you know people people have their own businesses and they believe in them and they have been working at them for some years but they oh, many of them complain that despite the track record that they have in running their businesses they still battle to raise capital especially when they want to scale up. And you shared with us, uh, you know, your experience and your view based on personal experience that that uh, there's a way in which people could could improve their applications to financial institutions. Uh, t tell me that story. Yes, that the, the story that I often use is the story of my relationship with my bank when yeah. I was a student. Yeah. And going into my bank as a student in 1985 when I planned to go off and do a master's degree. Uh, because I had finished one master's degree from 84 to 85, but I couldn't find a job. And yeah. all of my friends had jobs. Sure. So I thought, what, else, what was I going to do with myself? I was 22 years old at the time. So I thought, okay, I couldn't sit around without applied. I'd sat every day and written 15 applications for jobs. And I'd get the same um, you know, result. we very much like your application, but unfortunately, you know, not at this time. Mm. Or mm. Anyway. So I decided to um, go to a bank and I applied. Well, as I suspect it's because you, you qualify too early, maybe from their point of view, and they would not... Uh, they would not say so directly to you that what do we do with a 22-year-old who's got a master's degree? Oh, it could be that. <laughs> could be. It could be, but I think
think there were social, let me call them social factors. And we're okay. talking about we're talking about almost four decades ago. Yeah, yeah. There were social factors that that made the environment in the Difficult United Kingdom much more much more different than sure. they, than that is now. Sure. And um, that's why I look at some of the issues with, like, for example, the changes that have taken place in the UK with with great interest. Anyway, so there I was in the United Kingdom, and I went into a bank, and I met a gentleman. His name was Evans, mm. Mr. Evans. And I met him. He had been the person managing my little account as a yeah. student. And yeah. I said to him, Mr. Evans, I'm here to borrow some money from you. Yes. And he said, um, oh, yes, what for? And I said, I want to you to pay my um, my 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 um my my fees and give me a living allowance and he said no but but why are we going to do that i said it's a student loan he said backed up by what so i said backed up by my word that i will pay you back he said okay for starters have you got an application have, have you got an acceptance at this course so i brought out the letter and i mm. gave it to him he looked took it away and he said well come back on thursday or whatever it mm. was so i came back on thursday and he had reviewed it and he said are you sure you're not going to take this money to go and um buy yourself a car or something or disappear i said no um, he looked at me carefully and then said, okay, we've decided about you. We're going to give you a loan and you're going to work out once you start working, you're going to pay us back. You know, that same bank, I'm still a client of that same bank. Unfortunately, Mr. Evans has passed on since since, since that time. He mm. was already a really advanced man mm. uh, in age at that time. He was near retirement at that time already. But I built a relationship with him over a long period of mm, time. Mm. And I paid back that money. And it took me a few years after coming and finding a job. It took mm. me five or six years after to pay back that mm. money. Mm. So that has taught me the need to build relationships in business. And to be credible, you have to be willing to take a longer term, long term view of the relationship. And it sounds like common sense. And it is just basic common sense sure. that the person trusts you. And that's why in some parts of the world, after a while, your proposal is less important than the person making the proposal. Okay. And, and in some places that you go to, your numbers may not add up, but you are the one making the proposal. Yes. When I went to go and buy the first property I went to buy in the UK, the first person I went to was this very same man. And my credit, my I made an application in the morning and in the it afternoon, he called me and said, <laughs> come and take your, your approval. Yes. So I believe that you have to start and get to know people. And then the second point, remember Achaguma, I said, you have to be persistent. Yeah. You have to be so persistent, right? Um, and determined. And I, we've done transactions, right, Tim, where we've been to every single bank in this country, yeah. of the big four banks, and we've repeated ourselves. And they've said no, then we've gone back again for another round. Yeah. With the same proposal tweaked. And we take the views that they made so we made an application and you come back and you say, no, we're not going to fund you. And we mm. say, could you give us an idea as to why you're yes. not going to fund us? Yes. Then they give they give you a clue, mm. right? Mm. Then you go away. Mm. You use that clue to tidy up the proposal and you go to the next bank. Yeah. And that same bank says to you, none of the bank says, well, no, we're still not going to, we're not, we're not going to give you a loan. Sure. Uh, you do this iterative, it's an iterative process. You keep doing and you keep on adding and crossing out all the objections. Mm -hmm. Then you start off all over again. This is now your ninth application because you've been to the big four yeah. twice. Then you go for the third time back to the same place. You're persistent. Mm. But you've ticked off, if you are able to, all of the issues that were the reasons, well, the, set, the spouse reasons yeah. for not giving you the funding. Well, I if, if determination. Doctor Charles Okia Halam, the chairman of AGH Asset Finance here in South Africa. I've, you know, my takeaway from what you have just said now is one: build your reputation with the bank, right? Mm -hmm. and good, based on good relationships with whoever the people are that you are interacting with. That's mm -hmm. very key. Number two: be persistent, right? Number three. Learn from the feedback that you get from the bank to improve your application. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because you see, many people, when we apply to banks and we get rejected, then we 
get downcast. Yeah. You know, we become very disappointment, disappointed, mm. and actually resentful. Yes, for that matter. Yes, and, and that's natural. Yeah, and that's natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, natural so behavior. I'm, I'm just saying that you know, therefore, you, in terms of your persuasive approach, is that yes, you may feel that way, but rather take it as feedback and improve on the application and go back. Correct. And because remember that that bank wants to do business. It's open for business. Yeah. It's not simply saying no because it's, it's, you. It, it's, no, it's, it's not you. Personal. It's not personal. Yeah. It, it is saying, if I put this amount of money in this, A, will I get my capital back? B, can I make a profit from this business myself? Yeah. What kind of profit? Yeah. And then C, how does, and it's all linked, is my reputation, will my reputation in some way be affected by dealing with this, with this counterparty? Right. Mm -hmm. And then so sometimes they ask that question first. That's my whole issue about the issue of trust, mm. wherein I trust you and I believe that your your brand as a person or as a business is not going to damage my brand. Mm. If it is found out that I, this bank, X bank, funded you to do X. Right. How would it how would my shareholders and my stakeholders react to me? Yeah. Right. Would they see me in a positive light? Right. Or not. Then I then I comfort myself. If that's a tick and I take that box and you take that box, I say, will I make money? Right. The proposal being made is I am sitting on this pile of capital. Yeah. If I put this capital in there. Will I make money from this allocation of this capital in the form of equity or in a mezzanine structure is debt and equity in some form? Uh, will I make money? Who is taking the risk here? So it sits down and, it, and makes this evaluation. Sure. Right? And then it then says, finally, right, what is the likelihood of this business? And that's linked. What is the likelihood of this business failing? Then when it looks at all of these issues... And it's comfortable with one, comfortable with two, but thinks that there's a problem with three. And that's often the problem with small businesses. There's, there's an absence of belief of the credibility in that, right? Yeah, yeah. It, the bank says, well, um, I think I'm going to lose my shirt in this business, right? I'm not going to make money in this business, right? So I think I'm going to turn this person away, despite the fact that they might have passed the other yeah. things and now on the paper I'll make money. I say take that feedback, right? And then find a way to enhance your proposition to the bank, right? So that the bank arrives at the conclusion that it can partner with you to fund this business. That means that you might take a much longer time in getting to your objective, but don't give up on the objective because you've been told no once, or told no twice. Sure. You might be told no four or five times. Be ready for no four or five times. Right. Uh, for example, there is no point having a um, an expensive lifestyle, a lifestyle that um, that uh, that involves you spending a lot of your own personal income to sustain that lifestyle. And then when the bank says, show me your assets and liabilities, right, your credit cards are maxed up, your mortgage has been in default a couple of times, mm. but now you've come with a vehicle with some other partners and you want the bank to lend you money, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's different that you had a smaller house, you didn't have four cars, mm. right? Your credit card limit was 10,000, you only ever use 5,000 of it yeah. every month. Yeah. And that's different from your having a, a hundred thousand credit card limit of which you're sitting at ninety eight thousand yeah, yeah. nine hundred. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, famously, I would like to say um, uh, to you, uh, Tim, that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, and it's well known, uh, go to their closest circle uh, first to try to raise money, and then go to uh, banks. And then, so another question the bank often asks, and says, who else have you asked yes. for support? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And why us? Yeah. And and then they take it from there. Yeah. But as we are about to conclude, uh, Charles, uh, you know, how does it work in, let's say, Nigeria or Kenya in terms of the uh, credit allocation or financial allocation given the ownership structure of the financial institutions, particularly in Nigeria. I'll tell you why. I mean, the, the, it's because in South Africa, the impression is that the financial institutions follow 
the European, particularly the British approach. And therefore, and given our history, of course, it's seen in racial terms that black business people's applications are being rejected. Despite all of the stuff that you've shared with us, which is very constructive and useful, but they get rejected because they are black. But, you know, this is something I've been thinking about, that in Nigeria, people go to whom? They go to banks owned by black people, and that's the perception in South Africa, and that on the basis of that, that's why they get allocated money. So what's different? Tim, I don't think that um, the credit process in Nigeria for Nigerians is any more lenient or for Kenyans or for Ghanaians in, in, in their own countries is any more lenient or, or easier. Um, I think that um, there may be, but I, it's, I haven't, um, empirical observation says that black people don't get credit and that's a big issue. And it's something that as, as, as explained earlier, we have to have some kind of careful social in, in, intervention to make that um, work. Um, Black business, black bank, banks in Nigeria are owned um, by uh, Nigerians. Black, as likewise in Kenya and in in and in um, Ghana and other some other countries in Africa, but. Um, the credit policy is no lighter, it's no easier. Mm. Um, so it's a, in a way, Tim, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good idea. It's a well-stated story. In fact, you could argue that um, some of the banks, they are not um, performing exactly as banks um, should really. And they operate in a very narrow space, in the commercial paper space, in the debt space for corporates. And that their retail uh, proposition is is really not very competitive, mm, um, mm. and is something that we have, um, uh, which we measure the competitiveness of of banks, and um, and that's the deposit. Um, lending spread and the higher that margin is that's a normal indication of an, of an absence of competition in the banking system and you'll find that a number of the african countries that margin is very very wide in some places much wider than here mm. uh, despite the fact that there are a large number of banks which leads to the idea that there could be some sort of cooperation amongst banks to share the market etc and there are studies that have been done on that kind of area but i'll leave with one thought as you mentioned that we're almost was concluding. Let me put an idea to you. Uh, about 12 years ago, I did a study on, on, um, on banks and credit um, in South Africa. Mm. And it's very interesting what one found. One found that I found that um, uh, the other paper is called Legacy and Credit Scores, and it's an academic study, but mm. the policy implications are quite, um, uh, quite easy to, to, to say. In sum, the credit behavior of individuals who typically would have low credit scores because of their location was um, better than the credit behavior of some other people who, because of their location, um, had better credit scores. Because, because of legacy, at that time, about a decade ago, the vast majority of, of credit uh, models took into account your residence, your place of mm, residence. Mm. Now, if you recall, Tim, maybe 12, 15 years ago, a lot of streets in the townships uh, um, um, did not have um, names yes. and the, 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 the earths were not properly registered, yes. right? Mm. So when the credit bureaus did the analysis right to get the credit scores they automatically gave a negative uh, value to, to the location yes and they were discriminating against the location not so much the individual yes the underlying assumption therefore which is negative was that because you were from that area mm. you were likely to um not you, but the environment. There was no collateral. Mm. There was nothing that they, the, that, the, that that the institution could use mm. to make back a claim if it lent money to you. Mm. Now, there, but there in the townships in Harankua, in Tembisa, in 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 um, in Soweto, in Alexandra, there in those places were people who managed their credit much better than people who happen to live in Rosebank. Hyde Park, 
um, morning set, all at different scale. Mm. So there mm. was somebody who was earning five thousand pounds, five thousand I mean, pounds, <laughs> five thousand rands yeah. a a a month, but they were managing their credit in a much better way than somebody who was earning 50,000 rands. Mm. But the big difference um, um, was that that 5,000 rand earner lived in the township, but they were putting away 400 or 500 rands mm. every month in the form of savings. Sure. The credit scores discriminated against them because of their location. So it's it's there is a lot of work to be done to try to understand how people actually use credit right? Who really poses a risk? Why some businesses are not funded? Whether in fact businesses in the township are likely to be any more risky? Whether or not black entrepreneurs are going to be any more risky than any other group of entrepreneurs? Mm. And what government type of government social policy is needed to make that change? Now we talk about a national bank that may come on board, and that's important. That's the kind of thinking um, in a careful way. It shouldn't be owned by the government. It should be owned by an appropriate group and structure. But more banks should come into the system, in my opinion, and more finance and change the financial industrial structure. Dr. Charles Okia Halam, chairman of AGH, I appreciate you, my friend, and thank you very much for spending time with me. Tim, always good to see you. Looking so well as well. I appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to further engagements on this matter. Thank you. And sir. our friends at Chagumas, and their regards to you. Thank you very much. I All right. To go back there. Thank and you. let me thank my friend, David Machabella, for saying, my friend, you go for it. This is the Tim Modisa Talk. Until next time.